You're listening to the Multiverse Fancast, proud member of the Misfit Faction Media Network. All right, then. On with the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Multiverse Fancast. Don't forget, if you guys are listening to us on the go, you can find us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, basically anywhere you get your podcasts. You can also find more of our content on our website, themisfitfaction.com. There you'll find links to not only this show, but some of our other shows like Cinematic Adventures and MF Uncensored. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Paul. With me in the studio today is Ronnie. Ronnie, how are you today? I'm doing swell, sir. How about you? Oh, swell. Swell indeed. <laughs> swole yeah. even. I don't... Uh, you know what? You're looking swole. I, 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 that's what I thought you were going to go with. Yeah, no, no, not really. But anyway, thank you. I always <laughs> feel like I'm Tim Allen in, in the Santa Claus. In, I was going to say in the Santa Claus. <laughs> I got I got stung by a bee. Evidently, I'm allergic. <laughs> stung by a bee, Scott? A uh-huh. big bee. I love that movie. Yeah, oh, classic. All right, so we are here because it is that time. We have another DC movie to discuss. Yes. Yes, we are here to talk about the, I don't want to say long awaited, but like, I know I was looking forward to it. I know you were looking forward to it, but the awaited, mm-hmm. the interesting. I, I maybe not long awaited, but I would say longly anticipated. Hmm. Because I feel like this movie's been in the make for like four years. That's fair. This is a movie that like people have wanted. The character is exceptionally popular. And for those of you guys who don't know what we're talking about, we are talking about DC's <laughs> recent movie, Blue Beetle. So yes. I don't know. Like, I know you're not very familiar with the – like, I was just sitting in the theater going, oh, that's, that's, a, that, that's a thing. I know that. That's yeah. A, so it's, we're going to talk a little bit about the character himself, some of the other iterations that we've seen him in, and then mm-hmm. we'll go through very basic thoughts, no spoilers, and then we'll do our spoiler warning as per usual, because the movie did come out. This is the first time we've done an opening weekend in quite some time. Yeah, it's been it's been some time. And unfortunately, we we were one of like 12 people in the theater. Yeah. It was, it was a little heartbreaking. It was really just kind of... It was kind of sad. Mm-hmm. I, I hope they do something with the character and the actor. I, I'm never going to pronounce his name. The, right, right. It's like Zolo Maraduena. Yep. Zolo oh, Maraduena. Yeah, there oh, you go. All right. Whew, I needed to lay down after that I, one. I was thinking I might have to jump in for the pronunciation, but you got it. Yeah. Oh, thank God. I need to lay down. <laughs> That one hurt. But I really hope, even if, because, and we'll talk about what's happening with this movie just financially and all that. But yeah. Yeah. So let's start off. Ronnie, what did you know about this character before we even walked into the theater? So I kind of sort of know about him because I'm pretty confident. Wasn't he in, wasn't he in like Teen Titans or? He was in Young Justice. Young Justice, thank you. Yes, okay. Mm-hmm. I knew it was like along those lines. I remember seeing the character in Young Justice, mm-hmm. and that's how I got introduced to Blue Beetle. And I think that's probably where a lot of people got introduced to him, even though he's been around since like what the forties or something like that. All right, so let's let's go back. First and foremost, this version of Blue Beetle is a legacy character. That means. For those of you guys who don't know what a legacy character is, it's a character that's taken on the mantle of another hero. You get it with Robin's, one of the most famous ones, where there's been several characters that have taken on the role. And then you have like lesser knowns like Blue Beetle. So there was actually three Blue Beetles total, (laughs) where Mm -hmm. the first one was, I want to say it was Dan Garrett was the first one, followed by Ted Kord, and then currently by Jaime Reyes. Jaime Reyes is a relatively new character in terms of comic mm-hmm. books. Jaime Reyes came out, I want to say it was like 2006-ish. Okay. So very much like in the vein of like your Miles Morales, your stuff like that, where a character that becomes even more popular in some instances than it's than their namesake. So yeah. it's also a very interesting thing. So Dan Garrett was the first Blue Beetle, and they do make a few references to him, you know, the mm-hmm. character, and they, they even show the costumes of Dan Garrett and Ted Kord in this movie, mild spoiler, but yeah. <laughs> and but they, they are mentioned by name several times. So he came out, he was not he was not a DC character to start. Originally mm-hmm. he appeared in Fox Comics in August of 1939. 
So yeah. he is not, he's around the same age as Superman, Batman. Like he's been around for a long time because we were watching the movie yeah. and producer Melanie goes, you know, Marvel did all this first because we'll, we'll talk about some parallels. But I go, uh <laughs> Blue Beetle's been around since 1939-ish. I get, yeah. I think I said the 1930s when we were talking, but yeah, he's been around for quite some time. And he started off as more of a vigilante type kind of tech-based superhero. And DC eventually did get their hands on it because... That's the way that it goes. I want to yep. say, let's see, Fox Comics, went, Fox Comics went out of business in the 1950s. And despite allegations that they sold Blue Beetle's rights to Charlatan Comics, there was no proof that that actually happened. So Charlatan uh, Comics still published a few sporadic adventures in the golden, of the Golden Age character before revamping the hero in 1964. They tried three separate times to use the character to do a self-titled series. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, obviously self-titled series is when it's the title of the character. Not like, like Spider-Man first appeared in Amazing Fantasy, not in Spider-Man number one. So yeah, that's why the so. Amazing Fantasy comic is worth way more than the first issue of Spider-Man, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. But eventually they replaced the new titles, and the new series was very short-lived. But again, he's a character that they eventually did take him into DC, much like uh, your Shazams and stuff like that. But yeah, he's never... It's funny that he is not the most well-known of the Blue Beetles. Which, yeah. yeah, which is crazy. But then, of course, we have Ted Kord, who took over the role, and he was a little bit more, he's a little bit more well-known. The Arrowverse mentioned Kord Industries all the time. Oh, yeah. And, like, to the point where we're like, when are they just gonna, like, give it to us? Like, we want this. Yeah, right? And we're he, waiting patiently, please. So they ended up teaming him up with Booster Gold, of all characters. And they, they had a very good dynamic and a good team up, and they were they were very famous partners in the DC universe but then obviously we moved it on to well he came out in 1966 that was when Ted Kord is uh, took over and he was created by Steve Ditko of all people that's really funny and he appeared as a backup feature in Captain Adam number 83 so same thing genius level inventor you know he, he very very Batman-esque uh, even in like the movie he's like oh here's his mansion like Batman became such a, a stereotype, or, or uh, let's go with archetype. Archetype's better for um, the superhero mold. And yeah. it's it's wild that like literally, you know, they're still <laughs> copying him. Yeah. So he does have an IQ of one ninety two. I don't know if that's really good. I think that's oh slightly above average. So like, <laughs> average. What, what's average? <laughs> oh no, I need to figure this out. But uh, yeah. Oh, Ted Court appeared in Smallville. That's right. We'll talk about that because let's get to Jaime Reyes. Now, my first mm-hmm. interaction with Jaime was actually in Young Justice. I didn't know too much about the character to begin with. I will be honest. Please don't yell at me, internet. But it's it's a, a lot like Miles Morales and stuff like that because we don't, Ronnie and I don't actively read comics. No. Ronnie doesn't actively know how to read. So it's like a, it's like a sensitive area for him. Yeah, that's the that's the problem. Is like I wish comic books were a little bit more pictures. I know, right? In it. Just look at his pictures. <laughs> but yeah, so the, our, my first interaction with him, well, actually, scratch it. My first interaction with him was Smallville. So they did an episode in Smallville. I think it was the last season too. Like when they really were starting to lean into everything, mm-hmm. and the episode was called Booster, where Booster Gold is the the actual main <laughs> focus. He comes back and he takes over as like the hero. Because that's what Booster Gold does. He's a character from the future who comes back in time to be a hero of today. And he's Mm -hmm. an ass. Like people just don't like him. So in that episode, Jaime Reyes gets uh, bonded with the Scarab. Same thing. The costume is rough though. If you go onto the Wikipedia page for Jaime Reyes, you can see it. It's like, I think it only has one glove or something like that. It's it's rough. (laughs) It is really rough. It's it was a very of the times. So, yeah. Oh, God, it's so bad. But he was also in Batman the Brave and the Bold, voiced by Will Friedle. I'm mm. a, yeah, I'm a big fan. He does a lot of voice work. And yeah. then, uh, let's see. In 2010, they had announced a, a TV series featuring him, but there was a test trailer, and I guess it never never came to fruition. But like I said, my biggest interaction with him was in Young Justice. And, and you remember, yeah. you watched Young Justice, right? Yes. And he basically, like... In the, in the season they introduce him, he becomes almost like the the star, or at least the main yeah. focus. Where they do they yep. have 
they have him, they have The Reach, they have Black Beetle, they have all this stuff. That's why it was really weird, and we'll talk about it in the movie, to see him and the Scarab interact in the movie versus how I was used to it from the show and from the comics, from what I know. But, mm-hmm. yeah, so let's let's just jump into this film. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, unfortunately, this film is in a weird, weird place. Wow. And that is actually Ronnie barking, not the dog, just so you guys know. Yeah, right. But anyway, <laughs> this movie's in a weird place because they announced it for HBO Max. And it was going to be one of the one of a few mid-budget films that they were going to release exclusively on Max. I think Batgirl was another one they wanted to do at one point. Yeah. Like they had that, that was their idea. They wanted to do a bunch, very similar to Disney+, Plus, but they wanted to do actual movies, like just streaming movies, which I think... It worked out with with Zack Snyder's Justice League just because there was such a rabid fan base to see it. Oh, yeah. But this movie is in a weird spot because they were going to do HBO Max, and then with all the shakeup with DC, they decided to do an actual theatrical version, which you can tell. There there are certain yes. scenes just just – just effects wise that you can definitely tell that they you know they're on their green screens they're on this and sometimes it's a little jarring but otherwise it's but we have no like the effects were pretty good all things considered yeah. but it's in a weird spot also because is it it was supposed to be part of the DCEU there are very very light references to other heroes very very sparingly yes and then you don't see any other heroes in this, which is crazy considering we just watched Flash and Shazam and <laughs> mild spoilers. Gal Gadot was in both of them. Yeah. And oh, you did, did you hear about the Gal Gadot stuff? No. So apparently she announced that they were working on another Wonder Woman film, despite mm-hmm. the fact that they said they weren't. And James Gunn was like, no, we're not. Look this way. So there's <laughs> it's very strange. Like Gal Gadot saying, Yeah, we're doing another one. I'm you know, it's gonna be part of this new DCEU. They need to they need to just wipe the slate at this point. I'm sorry. They do, but at the same time, it's like I mean, Wonder Woman is such an iconic character. If you're wiping the slate, are you really gonna get rid of her? The problem is they the Flash was supposed to do that and it just yeah. didn't. And now we're in this really weird spot where the DCEU is still... We thought Flash was going to... It was like their opportunity to to literally yeah. wipe the entire slate clean. But, yeah. So, it, it just... It's a weird, weird time for DC. They, they redid the ending yeah. to, to Flash, obviously. they redid, Apparently, they did three different endings for uh, Aquaman, including cutting out Batman, which is a shame. Because mm-hmm. I, I still really like that opening sequence with Batman in the Flash. Oh, yeah. It's still so good. Mild spoilers, sorry. <laughs> but let's go through the cast of this film. Uh, I'll do this again. Zolo Merdoena. Did I, I, all right, hey, hey. Yeah, yeah. I'll take Passable. it. Passable. No. <laughs> Passable. <laughs> Sp- <laughs> my Spanglish. I took eighth grade Spanish, so donde esta la biblioteca? <laughs> As Jaime Reyes slash the Blue Beetle. Now, he he was the heart of this film. And a lot yeah. of anybody who's doing reviews for it will are all saying the same thing. Despite the varying qua- like varying thoughts on the actual quality of the movie the general consensus is he has been very well received as Jaime oh, Reyes yeah. and I, I will I was a big fan of him from uh, Cobra Kai yep and obviously it's also a big deal that this is the first uh, Latino superhero in a main role mm. yep. um, comics have not always been kind to other ethnicities yes uh, whether it is just overt racism or scratch that S- you remember Kick-Ass 2 where he's naming all the, the bad guys and he's like, you got to stop with the racist stereotypes. He's like, archetypes. Yeah. That was the general <laughs> comic consensus for a long time. That's why. And also they play towards their audience. Comics for a long time, the audience was boys ages like 10 to 20. Like that was their demographic. Yeah. So that's why all the dudes are super jacked and all the women are wearing the most impractical superhero costumes you could possibly imagine. I mean, no. <laughs> Literally, it's just ribbons. It's just ribbons covering her. <laughs> it's so wild. Yes, like, it's airy. So, so you know when you're doing all those movements, you get really sweaty if you're having like a lot of stuff on you. <laughs> the super sweat is gone. But anyway, <laughs> so I don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> totally lost it. All right, we're but, talking about Zolo. Yeah, we're talking about Zolo. But for me, like they do a really good job at he he captures the audience like. 
he and they bring a lot. That's where I, that's where it was. They bring a lot of their culture into this. Now, uh, yes. pr- producer Melanie was all about it. Like she, because she yep. had some Hispanic in her in her on her side and in her family, and so like she, she was like, oh my god, especially with the, the Nana. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Like there were so many times she's like, yep, yep, that's how, that's that's true. That's how it happens. <laughs> So it was a lot of fun to see that. Um, and it, it's good that we're getting that in more comic book movies. You know, obviously, I think Black Panther really opened the door to be yes. like, hey, like, enjoy the culture while you're here. Like, it's not just about yeah. smash, smash, bang, bang. It's also about, like, all these other things. And it's nice to see it in, in comic book movies that it's not, like, comic book movies are predominantly a certain ethnicity, a certain type. Yeah. Yeah, I like I liked this one. But anyway, and Jaime's a great example. He goes to college. And he comes back and he still can't get a job. Oh my God, how realistic. Right? That's literally, I say, 90% of college graduates. <laughs> yeah. We have Adrian, Adriana Bazara as Nana. Mm hmm. Damian. Scene Al- stealer. What was that? Scene stealer. Scene stealer. Oh my God, she's hilarious. We'll talk about that <laughs> in spoilers. Damian Alcazar as Alberto Reyes. Oh my God, this, this is tough. Alpedia Carillo. Ca- 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 I'm tr- I'm do- I'm trying. All right? Isn't the don't doesn't the two L's make a Y sound in Spanish? Uh, I think because of the I, it might not. Maybe as Ro- Rocio Reyes, which is Jaime's mother, Bruna Marquins Marquins Bruna as Jenny Cord, <laughs> the daughter of Ted Cord, Raúl Max. Tr- Trujillo as Ignacio Carapax slash Omax. I'm trying. Here's one I got. Susan Sarandon <laughs> as Victoria Cord. George oh, sorry, Lo- you got that one. George Lopez got that one too as Rudy. <laughs> Tia es- Escobedo. Escobedo. As yeah. Milagro Re- Reyes. Harvey Gullion as Dr. Sanchez in quotes. <laughs> and Becky G does the voice of the Scarab, which is... Achida. Yeah. We'll talk about that though. I, I like Becky G. I really do, but it was it was jarring. Yeah, yeah. She was the oh, she was in Power Rangers. That's where I know her from. She was the Yellow Ranger. <laughs> that's right. Anyway, yep. so the movie is very it, it's by the books for a lot of different things, and I think the thing that's mm-hmm. that really does make a difference is all the cultural stuff because, in all honesty, it is very superhero origins one hundred and one. They don't they don't buck that trend very hard in this. No, no. But what did you think of the uh, the casting for this movie? I mean, to be honest with you, it, what's crazy is the fact that it's all, with the exception of, I mean, I would really say it's all a bunch of no names except for Zola Maraduena. Like, yeah, you got George Love has his big name, but what was the last time you heard about him? Well, it's funny because like you know when we I mean? were watching the movie, like we were like, the fact that they have Susan Sarandon for an HBO Max movie, basically. Yeah. Like, and I'm like, she's another one too. Like, that's a big, well known name. But at the same time, it's like, when was the last time you ever heard her name? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, the fact that you have a bunch of almost in a way, like, no names, like I said, with the exception of Zola Marduena, who is, you know, Cobra Kai, and that has a huge following. Oh, yeah. Last season's know. coming out. I'm really sad. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't really speak too much about the cast because, again, it's a bunch of people that I've never heard of. Mm-hmm. I mean, they they all, like, seemed really good. I liked all of them with the exception of the sister, Milagro. I was kind of... I hit or miss. Yeah. Like, sometimes I was like, ha Other times I was like... Uh. Well, as, as two guys that have siblings, it is a very good showing of a sibling dynamic. Yes. But I gotta, we got to also really bring up the suit. The Blue Beetle mm-hmm. suit was one of the best, I would say even top five, comic book adaptations in a film. Yeah. I mean, I, like, you can go with, like, easy ones, but, again, those are just, there's nothing crazy about them. Like, you know, like, the Spider-Man ones. And, well, the problem with like, the like, Spider- those have, like, nothing to them. Like, this is, like, like so intricate in everything that, like, to pull it off is Also, the, the problem is, A... A lot of superhero suits are green screen now, or, or digital effects. Like Spider-Man, yeah. to- Tony Stark, they all wore just like an apparatus that then they digitally put the suit on, which is fine. Yeah. Sometimes it really works, and then other times it's it's jarring. Yeah. But And then second of all, this suit is totally practical. 
This is a suit that they built. And I thought that the uh, all the effects in the face were actually CGI. No, they built it so that it could emote. I was like, yeah. what? Like, even Deadpool, they had to do the green... Like, the you'll see a lot of photos behind the scenes. He's got green screen, like, the green fabric in yeah. his eyes so they can move him around. But, like, this suit, I think 99% of it is just pure, like, him. Like, him in a suit. Yeah. And it, you could tell there's some really great use of the suit. And just, like, it looks fantastic. It looked great in behind-the-scenes photos, which is always like a, oh, that, that's kind of surprising. Because usually yeah. you'll see a suit. I That's why, like, I never judge a suit until I see an actual production still. But there are mm-hmm. very few times, and this suit is one of them, that I saw the suit behind the scenes. I was like, well, then, all right. Yeah. And it just, it worked. Even like, the, you know, they show the, again, mild spoiler, they do show the other Blue Beetle suits on display, but yep. I can't imagine somebody running around in them. I hate to say it. No, not at all. I mean, like, I forget whose it was. Like, there was the the one that, like, it literally was just, like, a spandex jumpsuit. Yeah. With, like, a little helmet to it. Like, that one, like, yeah, but at the same time, no. <laughs> the only time it really works for me to show those old school suits are a if they're done in a flashback of that here, like uh, Superman and Lois, they show him in the in the old school Fleischer suit, and it works because like yeah. you know based on his demeanor and, and just you know obviously he gets a new suit. But and then uh, the opening scene to Watchmen, the opening credits where they show the montage of all the old heroes, like they were all yeah. wearing like silly you know like the the very nineteen fifties nineteen forties type suits, which again. It's what they should be. But as long as they're not the main focus, as long as that's not what I have to look at for the entire movie, I'm good. All right. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) But let's, with that, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we are going to do full spoiler discussion of Blue Beetle. But first, a quick break. Hey guys, it's Paul, and the Misfit Faction is looking for your help. We are trying to grow not only our network, but also grow our brands, and the best way to do that is if you guys are looking to start your very own podcast. Maybe you guys have been listening to us for a while. Maybe it's something you guys have always wanted to do, but you're not sure how to get started. If you go to podbean.com slash Misfit Faction, you guys will get a month of free podcasting on us. That is a gift from us. So make sure if you guys are looking to start your own show, you reach out to us and go to podbean.com slash Misfit Faction. Also, maybe you guys have your own online business or service. That you're always looking to grow, and advertising is a very big part of that. If you guys go to sponsorship.podbean.com slash Misfit Faction, you guys can get $100 worth of free advertising, again, as a thank you from us to you guys. That's sponsorship.podbean.com slash Misfit Faction. All right, we are back, and again, this is your spoiler warning. We're going to jump into spoiler thoughts on Blue Beetle. It won't be too crazy, because in all honesty, like I said in the pre-show, or you know, before the commercial... Like, literally, it is a very by-the-numbers comic book movie, which I think works in its favor to have it a little bit more small-scale. Oh, yeah. But let's start off with, basically, the movie starts off with Susan Sarandon's character. Now, I also want to talk about this. Susan Sarandon's character was not that good. Well, I do know that she's not really a character in the comics. No. They created the character for the movie, and... Because they created the character for the movie, they then decided before the movie comes out, we're going to put her character in the comics. Mm-hmm. And but I agree. I mean, you needed like a big bad, and I think their thing was we need to figure out a way to involve Cord Industries in this. Mm-hmm. And what's a better way to do that than to have Jenny Cord in it? You know, and by proxy, Ted Cord too. You know, and we need to have a bad guy, so let's make it Victoria, you know, some random person. Mm-hmm. Like, in all honesty, they could have done it like they did in Young Justice, where basically he's just skateboarding by Cord Industries and there's just an explosion. And, like, literally the scare yeah. just gets attached to him. I would have been okay with it. It would have been a bold statement for them to have no villain whatsoever, but because you got to have, you got to have an antagonist in some respect. Yeah. But this, this gave me a lot of, this gave me a lot of Venom vibes with just, Here's the bad business guy trying to use the alien technology to to, yes. to do whatever. So it, it gave me that vibe, and it didn't hit me until much until like maybe an hour ago. I was like, "Oh, that's where we saw this very similar plot." There but it is. a lot better. This is a lot better. I will I will watch Blue Beetle <laughs> again. I like I liked Venom the first one, but yeah. I will watch this one again. This this one, like I said, the, the just the visual effects alone. Let's talk oh, about yeah. let's talk about some visuals. So 
Jaime gets fired from his job trying to defend mm-hmm. Jenny Cord from Victoria Cord, and she tries to, like, hey, I'll give you another job. Because it's a very strange relationship where I guess she still works for the company, but you find out that Victoria Cord took control of it when Ted Cord mysteriously disappeared. And yeah. now she's trying to basically use the Blue Beetle technology, which in some, I think in some instances, I think in this movie they specifically, again, we've only seen this movie once, and this was last yeah. night. I do think that they mention at one point that Ted Cord used the Blue Beetle scarab to create some of his technology. Yes. So they're using the scarab that they find. Apparently Ted Cord also hid it in a bunch of decoys. They don't ever mention that again after the opening scene. Yeah. And they he they're using it to create their Olmec suit, which is a project yes. that had been or Omac. I keep saying Olmec from Legends of the Hidden Temple. Sorry. I thought you were just pronouncing it funny and then like when you said it, I was like Okay, I mean, it's OMAC, but maybe whatever. Yeah, I'm just gonna... Oh, shut up. But anyway, so that's what she... What was that? Silver monkeys? Silver... I was always a silver... No, green monkeys. The silver monkey was the... the temp was the, oh, oh, was the most frustrating right. thing as a child to watch one of these kids. Yeah. It's a monkey! You're not putting it together the right way! Oh, God. <laughs> what a weird tangent this just hit. Yeah, right? But anywho, so... Maybe we pronounce OMAC right. Oh, Mac. Yeah, that's right. But we did get our reference to Big Belly Burger, which is the only consistency yes. in the DC universe, apparently. <laughs> yep. You know, that, that was a nice little nod right there. Yeah, like, you know, there wasn't any, like you said earlier, there's not too many nods. Yeah, you had the Gotham Law School. Apparently, that's where he went to, he went to school in Gotham City, which, why yep. would you want to? It would have been really funny if he was if he went to school with Victor Stone. Yeah. That would, that would have been a fun little reference. Oh, yeah. But we do get a, a a verbal reference to Batman, Superman, and the Flash. Yeah, Batman's called a fascist in this movie, which is hilarious. Yes. And when at one point, I think they're watching the TV's on in the background, and it's in Spanish, but you do hear Bruce Wayne at one point. Yeah, apparently there was. Some, I'm pretty sure there was Daily Planet. Oh, I don't remember that. But apparently they were. There's rumor that there was supposed to be some sort of Ben Affleck either voice role or cameo, and that James Gunn got rid of it but he's like no that's not true that didn't happen part of me starting to feel a little bit bad for james gunn like the the fandom's really coming at him like this has been yeah. a this has been a rough dc transition considering dc has had a rough time to begin with yeah, yeah. and but the thing is like you can't blame james gunn because he wasn't there for any of this yes he's he's picking up a lot of pieces yeah like, like if you look at like the movies that have come out in the past couple of years mm-hmm. since he's been there, these were all pretty much done for the most part by the time he got there. Yeah, even like Batgirl that we'll never see. Yeah, that would be a fun HBO Max release. I don't know why they're not doing it. They might as well just do it at this point. They should. I I, I wonder if it was something like let's see how this movie does. This movie has any success, maybe they'll consider putting it out in the big screen. They'll never do it. They won't. It's no. too late. It's way too late. They won't. They probably won't even release it on HBO Max just because it is such a mess continuity wise now. Yeah. Because uh, it's tangent side sidebar. Bat <laughs> Bat Girl was supposed to follow the continuity of the Flash's first ending, yeah. where Michael Keaton and Sasha Cali took over as the bat person and super person of that universe. That's why Keaton's mm-hmm. in it. Like, yeah, but that's also why they still have JK Simmons as commissioner Gordon. So very confusing. My head already hurts. <laughs> if that's Batgirl. We're never going to see it. So, and that's another example of such a great costume. Sorry, sorry, yes. sorry. That was a really <laughs> good costume, but talk, talking about Jaime a little bit, one of the best scenes is his first transformation because it looks so it's it's kind of scary like horror movie ish yeah. like and they all had appropriate reactions oh my god he's possessed <laughs> like it it was jarring oh and, yeah now, it was what, awesome though oh it was so visually good. Oh. is he gonna be naked every time now that's the way they made it seem because like I don't know what happens because so when he first transforms his clothes essentially go up in flames pretty much it's almost like it, the things like right? lighting like, a fire lighting them on fire, yeah. like getting rid of them like too you, you see that happening you see the stuff like basically like burning off of his body mm-hmm. and every other time he does that transfer or whatever you know transforms 
it doesn't show that anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like, what happens to the clothes? Did they burn away and we didn't see it? Well, it happens. Oh, it happened the second time too when they go to Cord Industries and he wakes up in the yeah. back of the truck because he's like, "Where, where, where my t-shirt?" And yeah. she gives him clothes, but then we don't see him transform back and, and yeah. for the rest of the movie. But I'd be really annoyed if it burned off my clothes every single. Time. I would just, I would strip first. <laughs> At that yeah. point, just take off everything and then, <laughs> just then transform. Hold on one second. Start stripping in the middle of the street. <laughs> I, I do find it very so. The only thing about this movie that kind of that kind of gripes with me, and it's not like a big gripe, it's the fact that he does not save people. He saves his family, and he yeah. stop, he stops the bad guy, but he doesn't. You don't see him doing the traditional saving somebody superhero scene. You don't, but I think that's because nobody was ever in danger. He cut a bus in half. Well, technically, he didn't. That's a great the, scene. That was a really good technically scene. Technically, the suit was going through its testing phase. The, the guys with the edibles. <laughs> yeah. That was actually really funny. Uh, that was a bold strategy, Cotton. Oh, yeah. That was great. But for oh. me, like, I, I, it was very strange that we never get... He does not save a single civilian in this movie. Yeah. And they don't but make I, it... I, they also I don't mean, make again, it seem like he's no going to. There's no civilian ever in danger because the movie was literally like... Oh, he's got the scarab. Let's get him. Oh, he's not here. Let's get his family. It's a very Let's self- go to this remote island. Yeah, it's it's a very self-contained story. It probably takes place over a couple of days. Yeah, I think the there's only a only civilian really was Sanchez. Yeah. Oh my god, that, that was rough. Yeah, that was. I think. Don't worry. I'm gonna be okay. That happened. We all went. Oh. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm gonna be okay. Oh, oh god. Yeah. But I. <laughs> Again, I'm in the, in the fo- if they do a follow up or do anything with him because they they have the opportunity, right? They did their yes. own city for this. What is it, Palmero City or something like that? Palmero. Yeah. So that was a mm-hmm. that was a created sto- city. That's not a traditional comic book city. So mm-hmm. for me, like it was, it gives them a little bit of playground room. We did see LexCorp. Yeah. That was one of the the buildings. There's a LexCorp building, and it had a similar yep. similar design to what we've seen in the DCEU. But yeah. you know that that's an easy easy fix. But what did you think about Becky G and the Scarab? I don't know. You don't so, know? I mean, when we first hear her, I could not really understand it. it there it were was, times, yeah, it was very like garbled and everything. Like, but like as it kind of went on, like you kind of got to understand it a little bit clearer. And I don't know if that was intentional because this is something new to Jaime and Jaime can't really understand it. Mm-hmm. They're not one until basically the end. So I don't know if that was intentional where we couldn't fully understand her until it kind of was towards the end of the movie. Right. I don't know. Well, it's funny. It's funny because one of my favorite lines, though, is actually the I just detected a large amount of blood flow to your mid region. <laughs> yes. Dead. Basically, that's fancy talk for boner. Let's all just be honest. That was the second time they had a boner joke. That's true. They did have yeah. But I'm fine with boner <laughs> jokes. But in all, yeah. it's still better than Ralph Bonner. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> my my only issue with Becky G as the Scarab was they don't have an antagonistic relationship like they do in the comics where eventually they learn mm-hmm. to work together. Um, yeah. I kind of would have preferred it. In all honesty, I would have preferred them having like a, hey, I don't want you, you don't want me, but we need to work together to, to deal with this. Because it would have added more gravity to when the scarab stops him from killing somebody. Yes, but part of me is like, if you do that, is that too much like Venom? And they didn't want to be exactly Venom, but in I don't think DC. so, because in the, in the first Venom movie, it, it they saved their antagonistic relationship for the second one. The first one, he's like... Hey, this is what's happening. He's like, okay, but you gotta help me first. Like they they immediately jump into yeah. teamwork mode. So I, I would have much rather seen a little bit more of that. Cause also that's what I'm very used to in the comics or in the T Young Justice, they did a great job. Yeah. And I have no problem because in Young Justice, the same actor did the voice of the scarab. Yeah. So it was basically him hearing his own voice in his head. So I, I have no problem though with how this eventually worked out. It was a little weird hearing this the the scarab speak Spanish. <laughs> But it, yeah. it, it worked. It, it worked for the most part. I do hope that we get some, some more 
though, in a follow-up, because I'm well, jumping ahead. The budget for this movie was $104 million. Right now, right now, it has made $43.4 million in its opening weekend. That's actually really good. We were a little that, bit, we were a little worried. And, and I think we talked about this. We were talking about before, it on the way out of the, yeah. Yeah, on the way out of the theater. And I know we talked about this maybe in the past. I don't know if it was on an episode or not, but I feel like a lot of people are weary about going to see this movie for a couple of reasons. One, DC. DC. Shut up. I brought and, drinks. Right, the track record lately for not just DC, but for any superhero movie has it's been rough, been really bad, right? And then also, it's a character that I'd say most people don't know about. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think because of those two reasons, I think the true test is going to be next week and see what happens. If it's a drop. I mean, as long as it's not a big drop, like above average drop, if it's like average drop that we normally see with movies or, you know, anything less, I, I think maybe that gives it a chance to do a second project. Maybe not necessarily a big box office movie, mm -hmm. but maybe some sort of like HBO Max show or something just to build more fandom for the character or even just having him in other films i'd be okay if he yeah. was in, like i'd be okay if he was in super superman legacy and like in a quick cameo or something like that you just i unless what their goal is to make the young justice i, I think it's too soon for a young justice also he's not you know, as you young start as he, introducing some of your young justice he's also not that young he's 22 in this film that was another thing i had he's 22 mm -hmm. right and yeah, he can kind of pass for a 22-year-old, right? I think he is in real life. Oh, well, yeah. But then you have, what's her name? Victoria, no, Jenny, sorry. Jenny, who's the love interest, that the way they made her seem and the way she looked like she was like... Older? Mid, like mid to late 30s, like... <laughs> like, like, I was like, huh? Let's see how old. With it, I mean... To each his own when it comes to that kind of stuff with the age gaps and stuff. But it, just, it was just weird that, like, they tried to make it relatable as if they were, like, around the same age. But, like, she just looked and acted, like, ten, at least 10 years old. Well, she's 28 years old in real life. And Zolo's 22. So that, that's okay. not that big of a difference. No. But, yeah. It's so weird. But um, let's see. I'm just – so basically what we need to worry about is – I don't. I don't think they've done a worldwide gross yet, which is a whole other thing. You know, you got your mm -hmm. your, your China yeah. and all that stuff. But if it can make its budget back, that would be good. If it can mm -hmm. make a profit, because that's the other thing. Marketing's the big thing. The, the marketing was the, with this was pretty light, though. All things considering, yeah. like I don't remember. I saw you know some TV spots and all that, and obviously the trailers came out. But the marketing. Let's see. Uh, they promoted the film at DC Fandom back in 2021. Man, that was that was a while ago. First trailer was released on April third, twenty twenty three. So that was like the first trailer was only a couple of months ago. Yeah, <laughs> like, so that's so wild. Let's see. According to this, yeah, as of today on the Wikipedia page, mm -hmm. it says Blue Beetle has grossed twenty five point four million in the U S. and Canada, mm -hmm. and eighteen million in other territories. Right. Um. So, I mean, I don't know. It was projected to gross 25 to 32. It did better than right its projection. It's yeah. Over, and that's projected in the U.S. and Canada. Yeah. So it's around what it was projected. Okay. So. It's, it's, it really, I hope word of mouth helps this movie. Because obviously we have one more weekend in August and then it's Labor Day. So like you're, yeah. the summer movie season is pretty much over. I don't and know. And you can't wear white. You can't wear white after Labor Day. That is true. But, you know, like, I really hope that this movie does well in the long run. It, it gets yeah. a little bit of a following and we we see it. We see it just do well. I just want it to do well. Where are all these DC fans? Like, I, I hate DC fans are only on the Internet sometimes, it feels like. Oh, yeah. And I hate the DC I mean, fans that are like, I'm not going to I'm going to boycott this film. I'm like, that's not helping anything. No. Nah. Because you boycott this film, what's going to happen? Warner Brothers They're isn't going to green light anything. Yeah, like <laughs> you want you want Superman Legacy, 
maybe you should go see this film or else you might not get it. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, what did you think of uh, the bad guy in this? I, I actually liked him. I, he had a nice story to it. And, like, you don't fully understand the story of why he's doing this until pretty much the very end where all of us, like, it's like, he just wants to be powerful. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, like Victoria, like messed with him. Yeah. Like he was basically a, a science experiment and didn't want to be. Mm-hmm. I, I, I enjoyed it once we found out the whole story. Cause he was very generic bad guy until yes. a little bit of heart, but I think it could have been better, but in all honesty, he, he worked. And oh, yeah. I liked how he went from kind of threat to real threat. And their, their fight scene at the end was actually pretty good. Oh yeah, like they they even though they do the the standard same kind of powers type thing, they use yeah. them very differently. So it it was fun. And when Jaime drops that the sword, the big sword, oh god, oh. such a great scene. But I think that's pretty much. Do you have anything else that you want to jump in on for this? No, that's pretty much everything. We you know we got a good amount of you know little Easter eggs in there for something that technically is not supposed to be a movie in the dcu Mm -hmm. because james gunn has said that superman legacy is basically the first first movie in dcu however blue beetle's the first character first character so So, confusing which is confusing because it's like well then how do you get blue beetle into superman legacy and beyond very carefully you know like (laughs) like without technically this movie having anything to do with it who knows? But I mean, overall, this movie was. It. it I think it was. A, I was expecting a little bit more. I. I. But you and I are in different places then. You think so? I. I, I, I was. I, saw, I got more than it, what I was. Hoping. I was expecting just a little bit more, but not in I, a bad way. I put the bar really low. Like, yeah. my bar was really the costume looks awesome. That was my bar. Anything else was yeah. just extra. But like I just hate I hate building up my my excitement mm-hmm. for all this, so sad. But yeah, all right. Well, Star City rating. All right, you want me to go first, or you would go, you like to go first? I'm gonna sire? give it a three and a half. It is a well above okay. average movie. It is a movie that I'll watch again, but it's not like one like I gotta get this when it comes back out. Um, it was a good time. It was also just a lot of fun seeing it with my wife, who really appreciated the cultural aspect. So. Um, yeah, 3.5 out of 5. I think a rewatch might increase it, but I don't think it's going to bring it down. I'm going to agree. Okay. That was, uh, three that was and a half, again, I mean, the suit, the characters, I mean, I honestly was laughing a lot more than I thought I was going to be laughing. Yes. I mean, Nana steals the show. Especially we can even when, talk about Nana. Especially towards the end when they're coming up with the plan to save, you know, Jaime and we from find the out island. That she, that and she's she... like, let me see the tunnels. And and what's her face? The the granddaughter, Jaime's sister's like, huh? What? And you find like, out that she was actually like part of <laughs> a resistance against the <laughs> insurgency. Insurgency. Oh my god. I that um, was like 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 there are so many things in this movie that I was just like it came out of left field and completely hit it on the mark. Um, again, you can tell this was supposed to be an HBO Max movie. It, it definitely had the vibe. You know, I think if if this was on HBO Max and not on the big screen, I think if you're looking at it from that view, this movie could be easily a four. Oh, yeah if they would have known that they were going to end up putting it out on the big screen, it could have been a lot better, I think. Mm-hmm. But again, overall 3.5, it, it hits, but it just doesn't hit hard enough to warrant a four or higher. This movie slaps <laughs> as the kids are saying, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's going to leave us just with fan feedback Friday. This one was a fun one. We got some interesting, so it was, a uh, collage of different characters. One will protect you. The rest will try and kill you. We have Big Daddy from Kick-Ass, Alita from Alita Battle Angel, Spawn, Meteor Man, as played by... I can't, Meteor Man. The Crimson Bolt from Super, Ju- Dread from Dread, and Marv from Sin City. So, here are... We have one vote for Judge Dread. We have a vote for Big Daddy. 
Our friend Alex says, I'm going with my guy, Al Simmons, a.k.a. Spawn. Hmm? Our friend Brendan wrote Judge Dredd also. Our friend Ryan wrote Spawn All Day. And then our friend Matt wrote Spawn or Alita, hands down. I don't think I've ever seen Alita Battle Angel. I've heard good things, but yeah, not, not really something that I was like, I need to say this. But if you guys want to participate in Fan Feedback Friday, it's super easy. All you gots to do is find our Facebook page, The Multiverse Fancast. And every Friday, it used to be between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now it's before 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time because I have had some time off, so I don't have my regular work schedule. But you can find it there. And make sure you guys also find us on all of our social media. We have Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, all that stuff. Just type in The Multiverse Fancast or Misfit Faction. Odds are you'll find some of our stuff. But I think that's pretty much going to wrap us up for today. As always, I'm Paul. I'm Ronnie. And we'll be back in a flash. See ya.